Greetings, everybody. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries, in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is part of the Day of the Lord series. It will be part number nine of that. It's a commentary on Joel chapter 2. So this is going to be on the Joel playlist. This is going to be part 2 of the Joel playlist, but part 9 of the Day of the Lord. And the book of Joel probably has Day of the Lord in the book more than any other book in the Bible. So let's get down to business so to speak. Joel chapter 2, verse 1. Please read along in your King James Bible. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Hmm. Where do we read about trumpets? You know, in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, it talks about the seven trumpets. Which one is this? Maybe it's the seventh one. I don't know. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. That means it's coming. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations." A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the strubble, stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Before their face the people shall be much pained, all faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men, they shall climb the wall like men of war, and they shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Now, my opinion is, when they talk about these mighty men, part of that, I believe, was like, happened when Babylon came and invaded Jerusalem. So, When Babylon came and invaded Jerusalem, it was just like what they were talking about. The mighty men climbing the wall. They wouldn't break ranks. When they fell upon their sword, they wouldn't be wounded. But, you know, sometimes the Lord will show an earthly thing and use it as a contrast for a heavenly thing. Because when the Lord's armies come to the earth to bring judgment 
upon the wicked, it's going to be just like that. All right, so back to Joel chapter 2, verse 10. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark. And the stars shall withdraw their shining. You see, this language is in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and in the book of Revelation, I believe chapter 13. I'm not sure. I'll have to make sure and check. I mean, there's a lot of prophecy in the Old Testament, people, but, you know, if you listen to your pastor and he says, oh, well, don't read the, the Old Testament. That's just for the Jews. Well, well, I guess we're not supposed to read the book of Revelation either because it gives you the same exact information, right? Verse 11. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? See, the day of the Lord is terrible for the unbelievers. Verse 12. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. See, we have sin that we need to repent and turn away from. The Lord doesn't have sin to repent of. There are famous internet preachers that will tell you that our repenting and the Lord's repenting means basically the same thing. And I think they're either misinformed or they're liars. The Lord has no sin to repent of. When it says the Lord repents of the evil, it means the Lord is going to change. The Lord intended to bring evil upon people as judgment for their wickedness and sin. Remember when Jonah went to Nineveh? Nineveh was a wicked city, and Jonah preached and told them that they were going to see judgment. Everybody put on sackcloth and, and ashes on their head, and they repented, and they turned away from the wickedness of their hands. And they, be, they, they turned away from their sin. And then the Lord repented. He turned away from doing judgment upon Nineveh at that time. There's a difference between our repenting and the Lord repenting. And if you don't believe me, look up every time the word talks. It says repent, repentance, repenteth. When it's talking about the Lord, when it's talking about us, there's a big difference. And rend your heart, not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger. Boy, that's good for us, because if he was quick to anger, I would have been destroyed before I even graduated from high school, I'm sure. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. That's basically bringing judgment upon us. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God? Blow the trumpet in Zion, Sanctify us fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and those that suck the breasts. Let the bridegroom, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. 
Is this a a a shadow of Christ, the bridegroom, marrying Israel, the church? Let the priests and the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? And people, that's what's happening today. The heathen are beginning, are having rule over us. 18. Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. But I will remove far off from you the northern army, and I believe that was Babylon, and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea and his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he hath done great things. Fear not, O land, be great rejoice for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring. For the tree beareth her fruit the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. The fig tree is the symbol of Judah. I did a several part series on that. And the vine, the grape vine was a symbol of Israel. And I did something on that too in that same series. So, I mean, sometimes the, it's talking about fruit. And that's what Jesus' parables were, people. You know, Jesus was talking to a bunch of farmers. And when he was talking about the harvest, I mean, when the fields were ripe for harvest, you had to get out there and do it. You couldn't say, ah, I want to watch the Super Bowl this Sunday. I'm gonna, I'll do it next week. No. When the crops were ready to be harvested, you did it. It had to be done. It couldn't wait. Otherwise, the, the, the fruits would, you know, they'd rot. So you had to, when it was, when it was, when harvest was ready, you had to go. Well, that's what Jesus said, what the end of the world was going to be like. It was going to be a harvest. And when it was ready, when the, when the Lord, when the, when the earth is ready to be harvested, the Lord will come. Not one second before, not one second too late. He'll be right on time. Verse 23, Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause you to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. Uh, by the way, the first month in the Hebrew calendar was... Um, late March or early April. You've heard the expression, April showers bring May flowers. Well, there you go. Passover is in the middle of the first month. The former rain and the latter rain in the first month, and the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. I've had a lot of Bible scholars say that oil is representative of the Holy Spirit. And I wouldn't argue that. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent among you. Huh. Locusts and worms and caterpillars are the Lord's great army, and he sent them? Wow. Verse 26. 
And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. That's right. The Lord's people will never be ashamed. I've never known a true blood-washed, spirit-filled Christian that's ever been ashamed that he became a Christian. I have never, ever known that. Verse 27, And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. I guess I'm going to be dreaming dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids, in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood, and fire, and pillars of smoke, the sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass, that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. All right, let's tear this, uh, well, not tear it apart, but let's, let's break this down, uh, this chapter 2 of Joel. It says, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, it is nigh at hand. All right, let's take a look at uh, trumps and trumpets. Uh, Trump, not Donald, but uh, yeah, let's take a look. Well, you know, that's the thing. When the Lord gives you a prophecy of the future, there's usually something that he did in the past to give you a glimpse of what's coming in the future. So let's take a look at Exodus chapter 19, and verse four, starting in verse 14. Uh, Moses has, they've, uh, Israel has left Egypt. Moses is leading them. And going up to, I think it's Mount Sinai, I'm not sure. You know, the same mountain, the holy mountain where the Lord gave Moses, the Ten Commandments, written on tablets of stone by his own finger. Okay. So let's read Exodus 19 and verse 14. And people, I wish every one of you would read the Bible from cover to cover. Read James chapter 1. Ask the Lord in prayer to give you understanding. He'll give it to you. Every time you read the Bible, you'll find something new. I mean, you know, I, I have an idea when I do these studies of what I'm going to do. But when I'm doing my little, my research, sometimes I find things that I hadn't even anticipated. They, and things just come to mind. And it's, you know, I always find something new. I actually enjoy doing these uh, studies. And I... I know some of you really appreciate them, and I, I thank you. You know, uh, Jesus told Peter to feed the sheep. Not that I'm Peter. I'm nowhere. I, I relate to Peter. I like Peter. He's probably my favorite 
of all the apostles, because I, I can relate to him. The, the language that he used, he denied the Lord. He uh, pulled out a sword, cut the guy's ear off in the garden, you know. And, uh, you know, he, he's just my kind of guy, you know. Peter really is. <clears throat> and no, I don't think he was the first pope. He was married. He had a mother-in-law. So I guess the Catholics should know the first pope was married. Uh, married, not Mary. So, all right, Exodus chapter 19, verse 14. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. See, washing your clothes is kind of an outward symbol of, you know, water baptism, you know, like what John the Baptist did. But that was only an outward sign of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And there's going to be a baptism of fire, people. When the Lord returns, there's going to be a baptism of fire. That's why we're going to get a new body. Verse 15, And he said unto the people, Be ready against the third day, Come not at your wives. In other words, uh, don't be playing with your wife in the bedroom. Why, I don't know. But evidently, the Lord didn't want us, uh, them, having relations with their spouses. Verse 16. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning, that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount, and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. Hmm. So thunders, lightnings, a thick cloud, the voice of the trumpet, and uh, people were trembling because that would scare the heck out of you, huh? And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the nether part of the mount. What's the nether part? That's far, far away. I don't want to get close to this. I want to, you know, they're, you know the, the people that were in school that always sat in the back of the class? Yeah, yeah. I got to be here, but I don't want to be too close to this. You know, there's lightnings, there's thunders. It's scary, people. It's scary. You know, the blowing of the trumpet was uh, something very interesting. Leviticus 23, 24. You could always pause the study and go read the entire chapter by yourself. I'm just throwing these out there to give you a general background. Uh, I've had people accuse me of pulling verses out of context. Yeah, they always do that. So speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets and holy convocation. That's like a holiday. Leviticus 25.9 Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. In the day of atonement shall ye make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. So there was times when, uh, you know, they would blow the trumpets for certain days of holy days and then they would blow an alarm for trumpets when the enemy was at the gate uh, to warn the men of war so that, you know, the enemy's coming. So the trumpets has a lot of meaning in the Bible. If you've read the book of Joshua, remember when the uh, Israel was circling Jericho? And they marched around, and they blew the trumpets, and the walls fell down flat. 
So, Book of Judges uh, records where they were having wars and they would blow the trumpets. And, uh, you know, it was a, a cry of the, the Lord's battle. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 6, trumpets were used for temple worship. And the priests waited on their offices, the Levites also with their uh, with instruments of music of the Lord, which David the king had made to praise the Lord, because his mercy endureth forever. Because his mercy endureth forever. When David praised by their ministry, and the priests sounded trumpets before them, and all Israel stood. In Psalms chapter 47 and verse 5, we read, God, God is gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. In Isaiah 18 and verse 3, All ye inhabitants of the world and dwellers on the earth, see when he lifteth up an ensign on the mountains, and when he bloweth a trumpet, hear ye. What's an ensign? It's like a, um, it's like uh, an army when it's carrying the flag of the country that they're from. That's what an ensign is. In Isaiah. 27 and verse 13. And it shall come to pass in that day. What day? Day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass in that day that the great trumpet shall be blown. And they shall come which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria and the outcasts in the land of Egypt and shall worship the Lord in the holy mount at Jerusalem. See, Isaiah's got a whole bunch of uh, all kinds of prophecy in it. All right, go to the book of Amos, chapter 2-2. Two, two. Uh, Moab inter evidently intermarried with the Canaanites. So that's the name of that tune. All right. But I will send a fire upon Moab, and it shall devour the palaces of Kerioth, and Moab shall die with tumult, with shouting, and with the sound of the trumpet. Amos 3 and verse 6. Shall a trumpet be blown in the city, and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in a city, and the Lord hath not done it? In other words, nothing happens without the Lord allowing it. Nothing. When the Lord brings evil upon a people, it's because of their wickedness. So, speaking of trumpets, let's go to Matthew 6 and verse 2. Jesus speaking. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, alms is doing, is doing your charity work. You know, if you're uh, giving food to somebody that's disabled, that's doing alms. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues, and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Matthew 24 and verse 31. We're going to go back to Matthew 24 as we go into the book of Joel. Jesus speaking. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect 
from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. All right, let's go to the book of Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I guess we're going to read the whole chapter. Verse 1. Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For we, for we know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we have as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. Didn't Jesus say that was a new commandment he, get, he gave that we should love one another? Boy, I tell you what, I, I've been to church places, well, businesses, 501c3 tax-exempt businesses with the, with, the name, uh, uh, with the business name that said church in it, where there was absolutely no love at all. I mean, unbelievable. For ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another, and indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. Macedonia was the uh, province north of Greece. They spoke Greek. I think if you live next to Greece and you speak Greek, I think you're Greek. But uh, Alexander the Great, he was from Macedonia. He conquered just about the entire known world at that time. He conquered uh, the area of Israel and Jerusalem prior to the Roman Empire. So that is one reason, that is the main reason why Greek was the common language of the day in that part of the Roman Empire. It was the common language of commerce. So, if you lived in the day of Jesus, uh, if you were conducting business with Rome, government business, you needed to know Latin. If you were conducting regular commerce and business, you needed to know Greek. And if you went to the temple to learn from the Torah, you needed to know Hebrew. And I, you know, I, I get people that say, well, Jesus didn't know Greek. Well, where's that in the Bible? I wonder if Jesus preached his sermons in Greek. I mean, after all, the entire New Testament was written in Greek. You know, there are no Hebrew, ancient Hebrew manuscripts of the New Testament. There are none. And then you've got the Septuagint that Alexander supposedly wanted that he had 70 elders, scribes, translate the Hebrew or Old Testament into the Greek. I don't know how true it is. I've heard people say yes. I've heard people say no. I don't know. I wasn't there. And indeed you do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia, but we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more, and that ye study to be quiet, and to do your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. In other words, don't sit around trying to collect welfare. Work. That ye may walk honestly toward them that are without, 
and that ye may have lack of nothing. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. What does ignorant mean? It means you don't, you do not know something. A three-year-old child is ignorant of algebra. Okay? But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. And when it talks about those that are asleep, uh, that's a euphemism for being dead. Concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and I do, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Doesn't sound like a secret rapture, does it? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Not necessarily Donald, right? And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Remember that. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. In the clouds. Remember that. I did an entire Bible study on in the clouds. In the clouds. Didn't Joel talk about the clouds? Oh, yeah. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them. Who's them? The Christ. Christ coming down with the dead that are being resurrected. That's them. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And I tell you people, if there is somebody claiming to be the Messiah and we're not caught up together to meet him in the air, it's the wrong Messiah. Matthew 24, Jesus warned the false Christ would come first. If we're not caught up to meet the Lord in the air, in the clouds, it's the wrong Messiah. Period. All right, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This ties in with what we just read and ties in with the book of Joel. I have a feeling this is going to be a long, this is going to be a long study. Oh, let's see. I was looking for a place to start. I guess we're going to start from the beginning. We're going to read another chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures." Paul wrote this stuff. How in the world can people read this and say Paul is a false apostle? Those people are devils. When you hear people saying that Paul's a false apostle, you know, verse 4, verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, 
and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. Who's Cephas? Peter. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And I believe James here could have been, uh, there was a James, he's got a book, the book of James. I'm not sure if it's the same one. But uh, James had a mother named Mary and a father named Joseph. And he grew up with a guy named Jesus. Can you imagine growing up in, in, in the household with Jesus? Can you imagine? You know, and you kind of wonder, you know. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? You see, the Sadducees, a denomination of the Jews, they didn't believe the prophets of the Bible. They only believed the Torah. That was Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They only believed the books of five books of Moses. That's it. They didn't believe the Psalms. They didn't believe Isaiah. They didn't believe Joel. They didn't believe none of that stuff. If, if Moses didn't get credit for writing it, they didn't believe it. Well, guess what? There's no resurrection in the books of Moses. So they didn't believe it. They didn't believe it. They just thought, well, when you die, that's it. Boom, you're gone. That's it. That's the end. That's why they were sad, you see. That's an old one. That's that's not mine. So Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen... Then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and ye are yet in your sins." Then they also, which are fallen asleep in Christ, are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Yeah, we're like those Sadducee Jews. We're most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. But since by man, Adam, for since by man came death, by man, Jesus, Christ, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are at Christ, they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end. 
when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, whom, I'm sorry, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Did you know that death is the last enemy of a Christian? And it's going to be destroyed. Verse 27. For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also, be, also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Else, what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? Huh. You know, the only people I know today that baptize for the dead are the Mormons. Else, what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? And why stand we, stand we in jeopardy every hour? See, they were being persecuted people for, the, for Christ. I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus, our Lord, I die daily. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus. Isn't that interesting? If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus. I think he's talking about two-legged beasts. What advantage, what advantage it me if the dead rise not let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die you ever heard that eat drink and be merry for tomorrow we die be not deceived evil communications corrupt good manners awake to righteousness and sin not for some have not the knowledge of God I speak this to your shame huh how many Christians don't share the gospel? Now, I'm as guilty as that as anybody. I mean, I'm not an evangelist. Some of you out there have the gift of evangelism. I don't. I'm a teacher. I mean, I, it took me a long time to figure out what my gift was. I'm a teacher. I'm not an evangelist. I don't think I've ever won anybody to Christ. Lord knows I've tried. I speak this to your shame. But some men will say, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool! That which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body, that shall be but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain. You see, when you plant a seed, the seed has to be destroyed for the plant to come up from the seed. And your, our bodies are the same thing. You know, our physical flesh, it's not going to last. It's going to be worm food one day. But we're going to get a new resurrected body. Verse 38. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh. But there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies. Celestial return, uh, speaks of the spiritual realm. Angels, angelic. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. Have you ever heard of, um, on a map, uh, or somebody said, oh, that's some rough terrain? Well, that's what it refers to. Terrestrial refers to the earth. So, 
there are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, that's referring to Christ, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy, and as in the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, listen carefully. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the Donald Trump. Oh, oh, wait a minute. No. no. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last Trump. In a moment, in the we're, we're going to be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Now that's very interesting. It says we're going to be changed at the last trump. How many trumps are there in Revelation? There's seven. Which one's the last one? Uh, Pre-tribbers will tell you it's number eight. But there is no number eighth trumpet in the book of Revelation. Uh, yeah, I know. They'll tell you that the last trump is not the seventh trump of the book of Revelation. Oh, no, there, that's a different last trump. Uh, where's that in the Bible? Can you show me? Uh, and they'll try to change the subject. Because that's all they can do. They can't show you from the Bible. I say the seventh trump is the last trump. The seventh trump in the book of Revelation is the last one. I don't see an eighth one. I don't see a ninth one. I don't see a tenth one. I don't see an eleventh, twelfth, thirteenth, twenty, or hundredth. There's seven of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven is the last. If you have seven students and you have them line up in a row, one of them's going to be on the end. That's the last one. Duh! In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised. Didn't we read that the dead would be raised first? Oh, yeah. And the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall I put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Hmm. In Revelation chapter 8, verse 6, and it says, And the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. You know, this is uh, part nine of Day of the Lord. And I'm going to have to make this part A of Joel chapter 2. There's going to be a second, uh, I guess, a Joel chapter 2 part B, because this has already been an hour, and I'm just getting started. Uh, I'm going to have to cover the moon turning to blood and the sun going dark. I've covered it a little bit, somewhat, in the other parts of the day of the Lord. But to do justice to Joel, the book of Joel, I'm going to have to probably make another hour's study on this. So I'm going to probably, I'm going to have to end this right now. So please come back for part B of Joel chapter 2. It will be part uh, 10 of the day of the Lord. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. And that's Jesus who is the Christ, in his precious name. Amen.